I'm Sandra Neal. That's Sandra Copeland Neal. I have been flying for American Airlines for 50 years, and I started when I was 19 years old. My senior year in high school, uh, we had uh, a stewardess. I can't remember what airline she flew for. She came to our high school for career day. And that was just so amazing to me because she was so well-groomed and, and polite and very pretty. I had just turned 19 and my mother and Aunt Cleo drove me to Love Field I walked in, no appointment, and a lady gave me a clipboard and said, please go over there and sit down and fill this out. After that, I was called into a room with a gentleman, his name was KB Hazard, and he interviewed me. He had me walk for him, talk about my family, religion, Growing up Baptist, he asked me, how do you feel about serving a drink? And I said, well, just because I serve a drink doesn't mean I have to drink it. He liked that answer a lot. They could ask anything just about religion, um, what I, why I wanted to fly. And of course, my standard answer was, I love people, <laughs> I love to travel, and I'll go anywhere. Of course, the only airplane ride I'd ever had was at Six Flags in a helicopter. And I had no clue if I liked to fly or not. <laughs> I think my first airplane, my first real airplane ride was when I was in uh, stewardess training. And we had to go on an observation ride. We went to Chicago and back in the dead of winter. And we just got off the airplane briefly and then got back on the airplane and flew right back to Dallas. I can remember the flight attendants, our stewardesses then, telling us, just sit and watch, please don't get in our way, which, which we were petrified and we wouldn't have dared gotten that way unless they'd asked us to do something. Um, so we obeyed all the rules. We were dressed to the nines, heels, suits, and nobody traveled um, like they do today. Flight attendant training at that time, stewardess training at that time, was six weeks. And we had to go through hands-on operation. It was 1967. It was a Jackie O era. We had, um, we had to serve with real food and real plates and everything was very heavy to carry. Uh, we dressed in suits, hose, girdles, and um, heels, of course, every day for training. We didn't get our uniforms until probably the fifth week of training. And that, like I said, that was January 1st, 1967 is when we got there. January 2nd, we hit the ground running training and they kept us going. Everything was handwritten. There were no computers or um, any, anything that we had to do online. Everything was handwritten by paper. We studied hard. I learned how to smoke because if you didn't keep your weight down, uh, you would not graduate training that six weeks. One of my roommates, Noelle, she was two pounds overweight the night before graduation she was not going to graduate if she hadn't lost that two pounds. That particular evening, we had an outdoor pool, uh, no exercise room, and we went down with her in our coats while she swam in the pool. She took x lax <laughs> and by the morning of graduation, she was right at her weight and she graduated with us. So we all went to Boston. There was uh, like 13 of us who moved to Boston. What a great city. Well, Boston was my first base. We got there, we had to go through uh, New York's Kennedy Airport and then transfer over by 
a limo to LaGuardia. And um, it, it was, like I said, February 16th, the day we graduated. It was freezing cold, snow all over the place. We got to Boston. And American Airlines at that time, they gave us $200 cash when we left training because we needed, most of us really were from small towns. We had not worked in a while for six weeks, so we really didn't have a lot of cash in our pocket. And they gave us $200. They gave us three nights at the Sheraton Palace, downtown Boston. They arranged for a gentleman to pick us up. He was a real estate agent, I believe. I never really knew his full title, but his name was Warren Romer. And Warren took us to see some places, apartments to live in the nicer section of Boston, which was Brookline, Mass. Uh, we lived at 32, we, he took us to 32 Powell Street. There were 13 flight attendants that went to Boston in my class. Uh, there were two apartments available, one on the top floor, one on the bottom floor, and there were six of us in my apartment, uh, four in the upstairs apartment, and two of the flight attendants actually lived in Boston, so they went back to live with their families um, until we all got situated. Boston's a huge sports town, and we got to meet a lot of the players that played for the Bruins. They gave us free tickets, of course, because we couldn't afford the tickets and um, had the best seats in the house. And it was just an amazing time. We got to go to a lot of Red Sox games and basketball games. We knew a lot of the sports people and it was, it was a fun time. But the Bruins was great because I had the opportunity to meet Bobby Orr and Derek Sanderson. They were rookies for the Bruins and uh, they came over the house quite often, just, you know, to hang out. And it was a good time. I went to San Diego uh, in 1974. Uh, the base opened up, a new base, brand new. And we all, a bunch of us, 11 of us, I think there were, that transferred to San Diego. And in those days, I didn't have a lot of furniture or belongings um, because we did live in an apartment. We rented most of our furniture at that time. And um, the Skycaps, we all knew each other. And they actually, I would take a box or two every time I flew to the airport. They would check them for me on the flight to San Diego. And in San Diego, they would send them to air freight and they held them for me until I got to San Diego. So life was really quite simple then. And people really helped each other. But San Diego is a great base too. I, I was there for two years and then eventually moved to San Francisco. Lived there for 13 years, and I love San Francisco too. Once again, a big sports town. You have all the theaters, you have everything refined in San Francisco, more so than LA. The northern part of the state was just uh, more my cup of tea. When you'd go across the Golden Gate Bridge, it was just magical. It's just so glittery and really, really pretty. You just see the city, it was just, it was beautiful all the time. Then, eventually, I moved back to Dallas where I had my two lovely daughters, <laughs> Sean and Shannon. I, I've flown places I would never, I never even dreamed of flying or thought about. Um, when, I, when I was raising my daughters, I flew turnarounds all the time, which means I was home every night. I would drop them at the school, race to the airport and pray that the police didn't stop me. And I'd get a ticket for speeding because I was hitting it really close to sign in. Um, and then usually I would be home by six or seven that night and take care of them. So when they were older, then I started flying international. Well, this just opened my world right up because I was flying to Hawaii, which was fabulous. I'd never been to Hawaii before. And um, then eventually London. Um, and then it just little by little, everything increased flying um, out of Dallas. We picked up new cities and um, 
just exciting places. I, and I was getting paid to do this. The hotels we stay at are really nice. They're paid for, our transportation is taken care of. Um, and many, many times, as my daughters got older, I would fly the long trips around Thanksgiving and take them with me. And they had some, some great adventures too. Um, I had a room, they didn't have to pay for a room. All I had to do was pay for extra food or shopping or whatever we did. But it, we had a, I mean, Frankfurt, London, uh, Madrid, Hong Kong, Osaka. But yeah, I just had opportunities and they got to join me on their vacations. So my only fear was they wouldn't get on the airplane coming home, but I usually had a backup plan. Um, I know in Osaka, I was concerned that Sean would not get on the airplane with me coming back. And I had a, a lovely, sweet agent there. And she, she said, if she doesn't get on the airplane, I'll take her home with me. And I thought, wow, this is family. That's what families do. You know, I wonder how she's doing. I haven't talked to her in ages and ages and ages. So, because we don't fly to Osaka anymore. You meet people because you fly with different people every month and sometimes every trip. Um, I've become very close to uh, all the people in, in different bases. I still keep in touch with people I've known for 45 and 50 years. Um, it's a bond, but it's a bond that you have that I don't think a lot of uh, businesses have. And it's the pilots and the flight attendants, the agents, you get to know each other, you fly a lot of the same trips. Like I, right now, I usually fly Hong Kong, uh, sometimes Frankfurt. I'm going to uh, Narita in Las Vegas later this month. Um, you just, I, I have the option to fly whatever I want to at this stage of my life. Of course, it only took me 50 years to get there, but <laughs> a lot of people don't have that, that uh, advantage. I have dear friends uh, all over the world, and um, but it's like Jenny, I, I love flying with Jenny. We don't fly together a lot because she's a purser and I'm a purser, so we fly different days, but we sometimes overlap our days in Hong Kong so we can have a day in Hong Kong together. Then my friend Mary, I fly with her. She's she is too much. Uh, I call her. Uh, I call us the the sweet and, the sweet and the sour. I'm the sour. She's the sweet. Um, I have to sometimes make rules uh, stick, and that's the only bad thing about being a purser. Uh, you have to stay with your commitments and your service and. Uh, make sure that the passengers are all taken care of. You know, you want to make everybody happy because if your crew is happy, nine out of 10 times, all the passengers are going to be happy. And that's what we strive for. Most unhappy passengers just want you to listen to them. They just want a sounding board. Most of the time I will go back and talk to them, listen to them. Uh, apologize if need be. I have had to politely ask other passengers to treat my crew with respect because I don't want them uh, yelling at them, swearing at them, or treating them disrespectfully. And like I said, nine times out of ten, and a lot of times it's a hundred percent of the time, everybody's happy, it's a great trip, I love when the passengers leave and they they know I'm usually the, the purser uh, and they tell me what a great trip it's been, what a great crew I have and that's, that's rewarding that everybody has come together. Even though you don't know each other at the beginning of a trip, flight attendants, we may get on, we have all nationalities, creeds, colors, races, uh, but we get on and we band together and we support each other. And I usually ask them, please be kind. We've become the in-flight deputy. We are the, the police in-flight. Um, sometimes we have 
back up. We have uh, federal air marshals, and most of those times, those are they're more domestic and certain European travel. So we, we, we it's changed so much because you didn't have to be afraid of anybody. The, the worst thing that could have happened when I first started flying was maybe a hijacking to Cuba. But then as time has progressed and our country has changed so much and our politics have changed so much, um, that we, we really have to prepare and, and do a lot of training now for security and evaluating people as they actually walk on the airplane. You look at them differently. Um, you used to laugh and talk with people and um, it, we still do, but you, you observe people in a different manner. 9-11 was such a shock to everyone. It was uh, a tragedy that no one was expecting. I had flown the day before and come home from Newark, New Jersey. Uh, was watching TV because I'd taken the girls to school already and watched the Twin Tower. One of the towers was on fire because they thought a private airplane had hit the building. But then I saw a silver airplane that was flying toward the second tower. And at that instant, you knew it was not an accident. It, it was like a dream. It was like a nightmare. Um, it was horrific. I called the school, the middle school, to make sure that uh, the girls were okay and asked Lisa, one of the faculty members there, if I should come get the girls. She called me back shortly after and said that they were both at lunch and they were doing fine. She thought it would be for everyone's best interest to let them just maintain and continue their day, which I did. I called several of my friends. My phone rang off the wall all day. It was, it, it was just a, I, I can't, I can never express the sorrow, the pain. Just knowing that coworkers, not just, not just American, but United, went down. Some of them knew what was happening. Betty Ong was on our airplane that went into the tower, the second tower. She fulfilled um, all of the, the acts that were going on inside the aircraft to a ground supervisor in Boston. She gave them inf important information that possibly, uh, more than likely, saved a lot of other airplanes uh, being, being struck down. The company, the government, decided that it was critical. They put all the airplanes, they grounded all the airplanes. Wherever you were in flight, you went to the, the first available airport. We had crews, they were stranded everywhere. Uh, people were in search of family. We had crews in Asia, Europe. Uh, one of our aircraft went to Gander and Beverly Bass has, has done a, a theater production out of that, which I think is important for people to see to understand not only the tragedy, but the opening of hearts that came from such. People opened their homes uh, in Gander, uh, where Beverly landed. 
I mean, there it was a small town. There were airplanes all over the place there. And the people of Gander opened up their homes, cooked for them, took care of them, let them use phones. Um, phones weren't as, we had a lot of phones, but a lot of people didn't still have phones at that time. Everybody was handing each other their phones and making calls just to let family know they were safe. A day I'll never forget. When I first had to go back on an airplane, well, first of all, I didn't think I'd fly uh, for quite a while, but about a five, seven days later, when the first airplane started flying again, I was on a flight to Chicago. Um, I really debated and American uh, personnel or management, they said, if you do not feel comfortable getting on the airplane, don't, you don't have to. They never forced us to do that. Um, but I thought if I didn't, I may never. So I did a Chicago turn um, that day. Passengers were so sympathetic and loving and caring and hugging. Um, but that passed quickly. Uh, sometimes I have to still remind people why they can't stand near the cockpit or why we have to close off certain areas at certain times. They have forgotten. Our youth doesn't remember because they weren't born yet or so little they don't remember. But the older people that were around at that time, they've forgotten. They, they lose track of that sad time. Um, in a way, I guess it's good because if, if people really carry that heavy burden or grief with them, they, they may not travel. I don't know. It's, sometimes it's good to forget the bad and go on with the, the good times. Uh, it has changed me, like I said, in the way I look at people when they get on an airplane, um, evaluating their manners, uh, what they're wearing, what they're doing. One, uh, the shoe bomber, I mean, for instance, the flight attendants on that flight, those two flight attendants were so vigilant uh, when they saw him bending down and concerned about what he was doing, they really saved a lot of people's lives by by asking him and having passengers help them restrain him, or that airplane could have been gone also. But if you think about those things, uh, it's it's only gonna it's only gonna drag you down. You just have to get up and go and uh, go see your loved ones, go travel. Enjoy. Most of the time, the people you fly with, like I said, it, it doesn't have to be blood to be family. You bond. Uh, if someone wanted to be a, become a flight attendant, I would tell them to be ready for especially the training process. That is the most stressful time you will go through. Once you're out on the line, all that stress is gone. You have to retain a lot about airplanes, emergency equipment, um, medical. It's just a lot to retain in six or seven weeks. So just get your mindset ready. Um, unless you do something really outrageous, you'll make it through the training process. The pay is not that great. The travel benefits are wonderful. You stay at nice hotels. Every now and then you'll fly with a crew that maybe goes different directions. Maybe they all have family and friends there and you're stuck alone in a hotel. But you still can do room service. There's things that you still can do. Opportunities, uh, museums. You, you'll still enjoy it. You just have to get through that six or seven weeks of training. Your six months of probation. And then it just really kind of gets easier as you go along. We had to live no less than two hours from the airport when I started. 
and that was a long, that went for a long, long time. Now you can live in Asia, you can live anywhere in the world, as long as you make it for your trip. And that sign-in, which is an hour and 15 minutes before departure, um, you can you can do just about anything. We did not get passes. I think my first pass was at six months. I think I got two passes at a year, and I didn't get unlimited passes for five year until five years. Um, now the, the kids that graduate and the young people and the young adults that graduate from training out, they get passes right off the bat. They're not always unlimited. Uh, your vacation time is good. Your, you can trade trips, you can move things around. If you fly out of, say, Argentina, you commute. You can back your trips up and um, maybe have fly for the first two, two and a half weeks and you might have the rest of the month off. So you, we have limitations, we have a union, we have APFA. They, um, they set our standards with the company and you're limited to a certain amount of hours you can be on duty or fly. Domestic is different from international because some of our international trips, like the Hong Kong trip, is 16 and a half hours over. And uh, we have to have, we have a day and a half there, or almost really two days there for rest time before we can come back. Uh, so all the all the international trips are greater rest periods than your domestic ones. When I want to talk to a passenger, I would expect them to be polite enough to acknowledge that I'm speaking to them. Take the damn headsets off and please listen to me instead of looking at me like I have nine heads. If you could do that, that would be the best thing you could do is just be polite. We are human beings just like you. We want to help you. We want to make it a pleasant journey for you. And uh, if you can just acknowledge that we are present and talking to you. Telephones, I don't really care what your conversation is about, so please don't scream it. Nobody else on the airplane really wants to hear it either. If we run out of something, it's not because we don't like you, it's because we just ran out. If you want something specific, order it ahead of time. Most flights you can pre-order. And um, let's all have a great flight. My name is Sandra Copland neal I've been flying for 50 years for American Airlines and love every minute of it.